And so we're beginning a new series today called Foundations. Our text scriptures, two different places. These are powerful scriptures. Psalms 11, verse 3. David writes, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? We're going to see today. The pastor reads this way. What can the righteous accomplish when truth's pillars are destroyed and law and order collapse? It's kind of like David wrote this this morning, talking to the world today. The world around us is collapsing. The world around us today is confused. The world around us today is chaotic. We're living in so much fear today. There are fear mongers all around us. Of course, it comes from the spirit of the enemy, the devil. But people embrace fear, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. But then he said the second foundational verse I have for us in these series, Psalms 82, 5. David writes, but you continue in your darkness and ignorance while the foundations of society are shaken to the core. So it's our job not to be ignorant and live in darkness. This is the good news I have for you today. These are the best of times for the child of God who is serious about their life in Christ. It's the best of times. Oh, it's wonderful. I relish these times. When there's darkness, we shine brightly. So in Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us, God the Father, God the Word, the Son, Jesus, Holy Spirit as well, third person of the Godhead, make man, that's mankind, in our image, according to our likeness. What a powerful verse. And yet in educational facilities around the world today, among other verses, that verse is being attacked right there. But no, we, we evolved. How dare people say that we're made in God's image. There are people that live by hocus pocus, by Tinkerbell dust, somebody. They're crazy. We're being branded as crazy. We're being branded as people that just live with our head up in the air looking at heaven, that we don't know what we're talking about. God knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what he said and what he's doing today. We are created in God's image, his likeness. One of the definitions of the word likeness is personality. We are the personality of God in the world today. And the Bible says that God is good, that God is love, that God is peace, God is joy. God is all these attributes that show forth a different picture than what religion and the world shows forth about God. So if God said we're made in his image and likeness, well, what is that? Who is God? What, what, what's he like? Well, the Bible tells us. Did you know the Bible defines the Bible? You know that, don't you? Jesus said to us in John 4, 24, God is spirit. There he is. There it is. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Numbers 23 tells us that God is not a man. Now, Jesus is God, but he's also a man. He's the most unique personality in the universe. He's all God, all man. But God the Father, he's spirit. And so the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, now may the God of peace, God's a God of peace. Shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken. That word shalom means welfare health, prosperity, every kind of good. You can think of any kind of good. That's what God is. Think of any kind of good. And he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, may the God of peace, shalom, sanctify you. There's that word sanctify. That word again means holy. 
to set you apart. The moment you become a child of God in the realm of the spirit, there's a mark on your life. Satan can invariably see you and know you're branded by God. There's an invisible world that you and I can't see with our naked eye. But in, there's an invisible world that's filled with angelic host of God. Also some demon spirits. But greater is he who is in us than he that's in this world. Hmm? So you and I have been set apart. We've been sanctified, made holy. And the opposite of sanctification, the opposite of holiness is common. Before Christ, we're just common Taters. Come on now. Just commentators. But once you're born again, you lose that commonality. In your spirit now, you're holy. You're sanctified. The Bible calls you a priest and a king in Christ. The Bible says you're a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a blood bought people. That's who you are in the spirit. You're exactly like God in the spirit. First John 4, 17, the last part of the verse says, even as Jesus says, so are you in the spirit. Colossians 2, 9 and 10, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God the Father, God the Son, God Holy Spirit. It's in Christ. And first, in Colossians 1, 27 says, it's Christ in you and me, the hope of glory. Christ is in us. The anointed one is in us. God is in us. Two different times Paul said to the church at Corinth, what, don't you know that your body is the temple? He called our bodies the temple. The tent. The body of Holy Spirit. And so 1 Thessalonians is telling us that you're sanctified, made holy. But then he said, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body. So here we have the definition of who we are as a three-part person. You are spirit. That is who you are. You're not your soul. You're not your body. You're spirit. Remember Genesis 1, 26, God made us in his image. John 4, God is spirit. Hello. Amen. So when we're created in God's image, that means our spirit is God-like, Christ-like. That's who you are. But you have a soul, mind, emotions, and will. Your mind, you think. Your emotions, you feel. Your will, you choose. May your whole spirit, soul, and body do you know your body is precious to, to God? Amen. Paul said, you're bought with the price, therefore glorify God with your body and your spirit which belong to God. Amen. May your spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in Romans 5, 12, therefore just as through one man, that's Adam, sin entered the world, and death through sin. So sin opened the door to death. It was never God's will for anyone to ever die spiritually, much less physically. He said, and thus death spread to all men, all mankind, because all sin. So we're not sinners because we sinned. We sin because we're born sinners. That's what the verse, just, the verse just said that. Because of his sin, Adam, we're born that way, rejected by God, separated from God. But we know the story, that God loved us. And he still sent his son, Jesus, to die for us. To, somebody had to pay the debt of sin. And only a perfect man whose blood was not flawed because of sin could die for us. His blood had to be unflawed. His sin, he had to have blood that was perfect, pure. Jesus. So Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. There, there you go. 
There's a wage, there's a payment to God for sin. There's a payment. And the fact of the matter is, you and I could not pay that debt. We couldn't pay it. Why? Because we're flawed, because we're born with the sin nature, because of Adam's sin. And our blood is sin. And so we couldn't pay for it. It took a perfect man, a God man, a man who would leave heaven, come to the earth, become a man, and go to a cross to die for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, God's a gift giver. Oh, thank you, Father. God is a giver. God loves to give. God loves to give, loves to give gifts. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, most preachers, most churches teach people, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so most preachers teach that everlasting life is getting born again and going to heaven. Now, if that's all there was, I'd say amen. But the heaven's not the goal. Heaven is not the goal of John 3, 16. The goal of John 3, 16 is everlasting life. The Bible defines the Bible. John 17, 3, Jesus said, everlasting life is knowing God the Father and God the Son. The word know, it's the most intimate word you can come up with in the English language. It's a face-to-face, one-on-one intermingling of two lives together. Two becoming one. That's the word no. It's the same word in the Hebrew, in Hebrew, in uh, Genesis 4.1. Adam knew Eve. You know what that means. She conceived and gave birth to a son. It's an intermingling of two bodies together, two lives together, face-to-face. That's what Jesus said eternal life is. Yeah, heaven, that's the byproduct of all of it. Certainly, we have to go to heaven. Yeah, but here's the deal. We get to know God. Remember, God told Adam, don't eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's where most people live today. Most Christians are living their lives from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, if it's good, I'll do it. If it's not good, I won't do it. It's not the way you're supposed to live your life. Well, how do I live then? Well, I'm glad you ask. By God's word. It's every day fellowshipping with Holy Spirit, the God our Father, Jesus. Every day fellowshipping with him, being loved by him, being embraced by him, receiving his peace, his joy, his long suffering, receiving everything that's good about God. Every day, it's a, the Bible says in Ephesians 4, be being filled with Holy Spirit. When you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you're filled with him. But Paul said, we're to be being filled with him every day. Living by that small, still voice. Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin, the totality, he's not talking about your physical body, the totality of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. Again, here's why I exist. Because I don't want you to be a slave of depression and fear and sin and pain and hurt and all the murdering spirits that's in this world. I want you free. I want you to live free. Be free to be you. You have a great personality. Let it go. Don't try to be somebody, some, don't try to be someone somebody puts you in a corner to be. You be you. No, you be you. If you're the life of the party, be the life of the party. If you're quiet, be quiet. Whatever you are, be you. Well, don't be what somebody else thinks you ought to be. You be you. Okay? Now, look, look, look at this. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you in Christ today? He's a new creation. 
Old things have passed away. Behold, that word behold means wow. All things have become new. So we've been crucified with Christ. We just saw that. Our old man was crucified with Christ. On the cross, Jesus became us. God, our Father, looked at Jesus on the cross, and guess what he saw? You and me and our sin, our shame, our guilt, our degradation. He saw you and me. It's as if you and I literally were on the cross, but Jesus was on the cross. We, he became us. What a story. How can we pass this up? It's such a story of love and power and dominion. It's, oh, it's off the chart good. He said, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Talking about your spirit, not your body, not your soul, your spirit. Old things have passed away. Among other things, the sin nature, depression, wrong attitudes, old mindsets. They're gone, 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 gone. They wave bye-bye to them. Just wave bye-bye to them. Those old mindsets try to rear up in your life. Just say, no, you're dead. I'm dead to you. Get out of my, no. I'm not going to live my life like I did in the 80s or the 90s. Before I knew Christ. He said, all things have become new. What all things? The things of God. The very next verse says, and all things are of God. Look at verse 21. For he, God the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin. To be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Woo! Righteousness means right standing with God. It means to be approved of and accepted by God, not on our own merit, but based on what Jesus did for us. Jesus became our substitute, church. Jesus took our sin, our shame, our guilt, our sin, our sickness, our disease, our lack, our poverty. He took it all. So we could be declared righteous, right with God. You're right with God today. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Righteous. You're righteous in Christ. In Christ. That we might be, become the righteousness of God in him. Now let me show you. One of my favorite verses. He says, I am crucified. The Greek says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. This sounds like, this is weird. I'm crucified, yet I live. Well, if you're crucified, you're dead. It just, it's weird. He says, nevertheless, I live. But here he says, yet not I. Here's the deal, that Christ lives in me. Listen, church, the Christian life, I'm talking to you Christians. It is impossible. It's impossible to live. If you're trying to do it on your own. It's Christ in us, living through us. Loving people, being kind to people, helping people, encouraging people, being what Jesus was when he was on the earth, healing people. He says, nevertheless, I live yet, not I, but Christ lives in me. Okay, here we go. Here we go. And the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. What can the righteous do when the foundations are being shaken for the body of Christ to stand up and live by faith? To live by faith. To not have one foot in the world system and another foot in the kingdom of God. We are over our heads in Christ. We're out in the deep waters, not the little kiddie pool. Okay? No, no kiddie pool. We're out in the deep where you have to trust him. You can only tread so off so long. Tread water. You're out there in the deep and you're trusting him. What did Solomon say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own, own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him. He'll direct your paths. When he says he'll direct your paths, what does that suggest to you? Prosperity. God will 
lead you in the way that's going to make your life better and cause you to be a reflection to the world of God's love and God's grace. What's the world needs to see? Not just by televangelists, but by people like you. Just people that we're just normal human beings, but we have something going for us. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. That we live by faith. And I close by uh, just showing you several verses here. Galatians 3, 11, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God. It's evident the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Four times the Bible says we're not to live by faith. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 18, therefore we don't lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. That's right, outward man, the body. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Verse 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, hmm, we don't focus in on the circumstances. We don't focus in on the pain of the world, the suffering of the world, but we look at the things which are not seen, the invisible world. What's that? Faith, trust. He says, for the things which are seen with your physical eye, they're temporary, subject to change. But the things which are not seen are eternal, not subject to change. And we'll talk more about these things later on. But here's the story I wanna close with. So Jesus had just successfully with a few fish and some, a few loaves of bread, fed 5,000 men plus women and children. And now he had just come from this and he told his disciples, get in the boat and go to the other side. So that was God's word, go to the other side. So they got in the boat, started going to the other side. Verse 26 of Matthew 14. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, what, that's weirdo. That's abnormal. What's that about? Hmm? They were troubled saying, it's a ghost. It's a spook. Ooh. Ooh. And he cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, boys. Life is good. Life is wonderful. It's all right. Don't be afraid. See, Jesus always comes to the rescue. He will always let us know there's no reason to fear. There's no reason to live your life being fearful. He's not just around us. He's in us. He, greater is he who is in us than he that's in the world. He is in us. Christ in us, the whole book of glory. He's in us. Don't live by fear. Live by faith. Trust God. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, Command me to come to you on the water. What, what's Jesus going to say? Don't come. I'm not Jesus. <laughs> so he gave him a one, a one word command, come. When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Wow. Excuse me? <laughs> Peter, a man who was not even born again, didn't have what you have. The guy walked on the water by himself without taking the hand of Jesus. He did later here. He walked on the water. I want you to know today that the circumstances and the problems that you and I face daily, if you're doing what I'm showing you from the word of God to do, you can walk on your problems. Amen. You can tread on your problems. Amen. Peter was treading on their problem. You can do it too. You understand that? So he got out of the boat, walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, oh, here we go. The negative circumstances. I wish they didn't happen. You're thinking, well, they do happen. And you have to be equipped to deal with them. That's why y'all be in church. You have to be equipped to deal with this stuff. Because Satan's not going to lay back and just say, oh, here, just, just enjoy life. Oh, just have a great time. He's not going to do that. Right. He's going to fight you. So when he was boy, well, saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. He began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Aren't you glad God's merciful? Yeah. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him and said, listen to what he said. He said to Peter, Peter had just walked on the water. And he said, oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? 
Jesus rebuked them. He rebuked them. You were walking on the water. You were overcoming your problem. But then the devil brought the boisterous wind and you got your eyes off me, Jesus, got your eyes on the problem. Peter, get your eyes back on me. Trust me. Believe me. Believe what I have said. I gave you a one word command. Come. It doesn't mean to get out in the middle of the, of the, of the lake and, and, and drown. No. Keep your eye on me. You do that. You trust me. You'll have the right result. Because again, greater is he who is in you than he that's in this world. Give him praise today, church, would you? Amen.